Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036 0703 7681198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Lord Jesus, we ask you this evening that as you have promised and as you have spoken that it is not because we have great strength, it's not because we are mighty in ourselves, it is not because we are very, very uh, intellectual, but because you have known that we have a little strength. That's why you are opening these doors. We pray now, Lord, that the light of your wisdom will begin to shine upon our hearts one by one. And then, corporately, you give us direction on how to go and how to move into what you have said for us to do. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. We're now going to begin to look at walking into the open doors. Walking with God into the open doors. Moving deliberately with God into the doors that he said he has set uh, before us. And one more time, we're going to pick our, our scripture still from the revelation that we've been reading. We've been reading chapter 3, and we have read from verse 7 up to verse 12. Yesterday, we only spent time looking particularly at verse 8. But this night, we'll read the entire passage. And we will also go along with the Psalm 45 that he has brought to us along with this. And as we do that, we will be believing God for the light that he intends to shine upon our hearts. We read Revelations chapter 3 and verse 7 we read on until we get to verse 12 revelations chapter 3 from verse 7 these things says he who is holy he who is true he who has the key of david he who opens and no one shuts and shuts, and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, for you have a little strength, and I've kept my word, and I've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and they are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, 
I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name. Isaiah 45 I will now read from verse 1 again. We have been reading from verse 1 to 4. But we might get as far as verse 5 today. Even though when we begin, we might tap a bit further into the instructions we may get from Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold him to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two lived gates and the gates that shall not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and caught in asunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by your name, I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have so named you, though thou hast not known me. Verse 5 now. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I guarded thee, though thou hast not known me. May the Lord bring light to his word in our hearts, as we look at what are the strategies of working with God into the doors that he said he has opened before us. What is the first strategic thing in working with God into the doors that he said he has set before us? I would like to note that first strategic thing to understand. Since God can say it is not by power, it is not by might, it is not of him that willeth, it is not of him that runneth, it is of God that does what? That showeth mercy. So the first strategy, the first strategy of accessing and walking through all that God is setting before me and you is the strategy of helpless dependence on God. Helpless dependence on God. I will explain a bit of that as we search that scripture again and again. The first point I'm raising with you, if a man has no strength of his own and is waiting for someone to help him, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? He will wait for him to come. Am I right? And I know that one of the greatest temptations for those who are strong, those who have their legs, those who can do something by themselves, 
is to ask them to wait for you. Eh? The biggest thing you tell a man who knows how to do something and who still has some very strong strength to do it and who has the wherewithal of carrying out something even if it is not going to carry it to the end. The greatest trouble he has is for him to do what? To wait. Because he can do something. And you know, that's the biggest challenge in entering into the purpose of God. The challenge of helpless waiting for God to walk. But if a man is actually crippled and he cannot move and he does not even know how to move, if you ask him to wait for you, what is he going to do? He will wait. He will wait wait because what else can he do than to wait? Now, I want you to read that scripture that I know you know very well. Isaiah chapter 40. Would you like to read Isaiah chapter 40? I said that is the first strategic step in working into all that God is speaking to me and you about. The strategy of helpless dependence waiting for God to act. Isaiah chapter 40, 29, 30, and 31. He giveth power to which people? He giveth power to the strong. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he does what? He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they, they that wait upon the Lord, what will they do? They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. I would like to spend a little time because that is the primary strategy of entering everything that God is talking to us about. And you know, I was begging you literally yesterday that God will continuously look at me and you as men of little strength so that these doors that God wants to release to us might be opened without hindrance, without without inhibition, without any stoppage. I can tell you that if I do not stop being helplessly dependent on God, there shall be no stop of the power of God. Actually, it will continually increase our strength. It will continually cause us to mount up with wings as eagles. He will be willing to carry us to heights and people will be baffled and say, how did you get to that place? And the only answer will be, "Ah, this is God. This is the hand of God that has brought this man up. And why does God do that? That no flesh may do what? May glory in his sight. If there's anything that God abhors, God hates anybody 
sharing his glory. Isaiah 42 said, I am God. My glory I will share with what? With no man. Many, many years ago, when God came down to us, I remember in this place, God entered this meeting. When we were still very, very small, and God demanded that we must enter into a covenant with him. And those that were there in that meeting that year, we had a covenant night. It was a whole night of entering to covenant with God. And one of the things that was very paramount in that covenant is that God is saying, I will use you, but you must make a covenant never to touch my glory. Never to share my glory. Any day you touch my glory, I will not mind dismantling everything from the head to toe. I knew we stood in that night of covenant to say, Lord, we will not touch your glory. We repeated it over and over again. We told God that whatever he will do, whether he will do something small or he will do something great, he will be the one to take the glory. We sang over and over again. We said to God, not I but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard, be exalted. Not I but Christ, be loved, not I but Christ, the gatherer of the spoil. No show, no ostentation. No bearing about as if we are in charge. No stretching of our muscles as if we are doing something. No claiming of anything as if it is our own. We pledge with God that we will not share his glory. Not only that we will not share his glory, we will not touch his glory. Not only that we will not touch his glory, we will not take his glory. After several years, that covenant was in 1996 when we stood here. But in 2007, we came again for a meeting and this time it is among the, the foreign participants. They were also having a meeting here and the Holy Spirit came down. He said, and who takes the glory? As if, as far as God is concerned, there is no problem with his power. There is no problem with his provision. There is no problem with the extent to which God can go. And more and more and more and more, I'm becoming more and more convinced that there is no limit to which God cannot go with any man that he wants to work with, except one matter. What is that matter? Who takes the glory? Who takes the glory? Please help me read Isaiah 42 before I go back. Because this first primary strategy of walking with God into this open door, if we get it right, and if me and you never, never deviate, then I cannot see the end to what God wants to do here. Then I cannot see the end to the extent to which God is going to manifest his power and glory in our midst. What is it? Isaiah 42. I would like someone to quickly read that for us. 42 verse 8. I am the Lord. Lord. That is my name. Yes. And I will not give my glory to anyone. 
I will not give my glory to anyone. Yes? I will not share my praise with carved idols. I will not share my praise with a carved idol. Go on reading. Please read verse 9. Please read verse 9. Everything I prophesied yes. came, came true. Yes. And now I will prophesy again. Uh-huh. I will tell you the future yes. before it happens. Uh-huh. Everything I have said to you before, they have come to pass. Brothers and sisters, those of you that have been with us over the years, as God told us a lie, I'm asking a question. As the thing that God said in your ears, have they come to pass? They have. They have. They have. To the extent to which God had opened our eyes, they have come. But now God said, new things I now declare. And before you spring forth, I'm letting you know about them. But one thing I will not tolerate. What is that? I will not share my glory with any man. I will not share my praise with any carved image. When you go a little further and you go to Isaiah 48, you will see that this is critical in the heart of God. Who reads again for us? Isaiah 48, and this time, verse 11. Verse 11. For my own sake. For my own sake. Even for my own sake. Even for my own sake. Will I do it? This thing that God is talking about to us, for whose sake will he do it? For his own sake. The things that God is talking about for your life, he said he will do it for his own sake. For the, for the sake of his own name. For the sake of his own glory. For the sake of his own kingdom. For the sake of what he wants to do on the face of the earth. That's why he is going to do it. Start again, sir, from verse 11. For my own sake. For my own sake. Even for my own sake. Even for my own sake. I will do it. Will I do it? For how should my name uh-huh. be polluted? Uh-huh. And I will not give my glory unto another. I will not give my glory unto another. Brothers and sisters, let me inform you. When God begins to walk with you, when God begins to manifest his glory and power in your life, there's only one matter that you must avoid. What is that matter? Taking his glory. Sharing his glory. Touching his glory. If God continues to make me helpless, completely dependent, to such a point that there is nothing actually I could have done by myself if God did not do it, then I have no reason, no basis to do what? To touch or to share or to take his glory. Then there is no limit. Then there is nothing that God cannot do for me, with me, and through me. But because God is very sensitive To any man sharing his glory. The moment you begin to contemplate. Even inside your heart. And say my strength has done this. Even if you want to claim. Say my prayer has done it. And you begin to quietly take glory. Even for your prayer. The end of your progress is in view. And I need to begin to share this deeply with you. That 
for the things that God is speaking concerning us. If no one tampers with the glory of God, and if no one comes to share the praise of God over what God wants to do, then there is no limit to what God can do. And there is no there is no cost that God cannot and will not bear in fulfilling its promises to our lives. And there is no place God cannot go to ensure that his own name is glorified. And he said, I will do it for my own sake. I say, for my own sake, will I do it. For I will not allow any man to take my glory. It is in this that this first strategic wisdom of walking into these greater works, into this open door, that's the first place. And because it's very strategic, I am dealing with the negative of it before I come to the positive of it. The negative of it is that those who are strong in themselves, those who have energy, those who have experience and expertise, it is usually difficult for them not to take the glory. Those who know how to do something and those who quietly believe or think that things are happening because of what they did, even if somebody is here, and quietly, because God gave him money, and one way or the other, he was the one that brought the money for the work of God somewhere to be done. Do you know that he can sit down quietly there? He may not talk. Are you understanding? But something is moving in his heart. And say, why it not me? That meeting will not have held. Even though in peace house, they don't talk about what people did. But we know who is doing something here. When God hears that whisper in your heart, he pegs your progress. If he had wanted to release billions to you, so that you can be a channel for what God wants to do in your generation, and he hears you whispering and say, why he not because of what I did? Everybody in that play would have been confused. Though they didn't thank me, but I know what I did. If God were to hear that whisper, and I want you to know that God hears whispers. You don't even need to say it out. As soon as it is brewing in your heart, it has registered in heaven. And God said, what? Is that what he's thinking about in his heart? Even for that, so that you will not have anything to point to again, it could provoke God to destroy all that your money contributed to. So that when you are trying to say this, what I did, they say, where is it? Was it the thing that was destroyed? Were you the one that brought that boss that caught fire and was born to ashes? If we were depending on that boss, we will actually have been stranded. We thank God who moved despite the boss that was born. That boss was not supposed to be born to, but because the man who brought it. Are you hearing me? 
as quietly in his heart say, that's the boss that is helping them. When I understood how God cannot tolerate rivals, when it became clear to me that God cannot tolerate rivals, and if there's anybody that does anything in God's work, so that he could have a way to point at it. When I saw how God hates it, I'm, I'm afraid. I fear God. Look, let me tell you. You see, Peace House is nothing big for God to dismantle it. So I say, hey, you think God can discard that work that has been done for years? If it begins to share the glory of God. Are you hearing me? It will come down to nothing. In fact, you will come back here and you only see um, a chicken and uh, uh, dogs. Eh? And they will just be playing here. And you say, ah! When God used to be in that place, there are not enough car parks. But look now. <laughs> Nobody goes there again. Why? Somebody has touched the glory of God. Will you pray that none of you will touch the glory? Amen. Will you pray that God, no matter what you are going to do, I will never touch your glory. I will never share your glory. I will never, whether privately or publicly, allude to anything that will make me to share your praise or to share your glory. Hallelujah. God wanted to do something in the days of Gideon. And these 32,000 were gathered. You remember them. And God came and told Brother, Brother Gideon, he said, I can't go with these people. What was the reason? God said, they will vaunt themselves against me. They will say, my hand has delivered me. They have not said it. Are you understanding they have not said it. And there was no indication that they would say it. But he who knows the heart of men already heard them saying it. So he said, no, no, no. Said, Let them go back. Because when I will give the victory, they will vaunt themselves. Let them go back. Let them go back. And when God announced let them go back. 22,000 immediately were disqualified. It remained 10,000. And Brother Gideon must have thought that at least to carry 10,000 to go and face the people that are coming like multitude of sand with 150,000 chariots. Are you understanding? Even to carry 10,000 is it not too small. But God still said to him, these 10,000, they are still too much. I can't use them. They will, they will touch my glory. I'm rebuilding a strategy. I pray you don't miss it. Because I have no doubt in my heart, and I want to tell you that I have no doubt in my heart that God is able to carry out everything his mouth has declared concerning me and concerning you. There is no iota of doubt whether God will have resources to do it. God has far beyond all that is ever needed to do everything that he has said he will do in our lives, through our lives, in our time, in our generation. Hallelujah! I want you to know that there is no iota or doubt whether 
God's hand is too short that he cannot, he cannot reach where resources are for his work. Don't think like that. Don't talk like that. God is able. But one matter that could make God to do as if he's not ready to work is checking. Will he take the glory? Will he touch my glory? If I begin to cause raw miracles to break forth in his hand, will he still be a simple man? Will he not become arrogant in himself? Will he still be accessible and touchable? Will he still come under the power and the shadow of the cross? This is a very critical matter that God does not take light. Because I want to be explicit to you tonight, I want to say that more clearly. When God reduced the 10,000 to 300, he reduced them to how many? 300. And what was this 300? Look at them. If you can analyze this 300, who are they? Who are these 300? What do they have? What did God put in their hands? All of you check now. They have a breakable pot. Eh? A pot that can break. If you throw a clay pot that can, that can break, if you throw it on a rat, will it kill the rat? What will happen? It will break and scatter. And the rat will escape. So, God, there are the people that carry pot. And then there's a touch light inside. And then they have a trumpet to blow. I was looking at the three things they were giving. Can any of that kill a rabbit? Talk to me. You are coming to, to your enemy and you are blowing a trumpet. Is that strategic? Talk to me, sir. Why did God do that? So that neither their weapon nor their methodology nor themselves will take the glory. So sometimes and I need to share that with you so that you will know that God is saying, I'm opening an open door. I'm giving you a double door. You are going to subdue nations. I know whenever we say you are going to subdue nations, you see the way my hand is doing. Because in our mind, the word subdue has to do with what? Power. But in God's strategic move, no one must share his glory. So can you imagine how the Midianites, how God finished them? Check whether any of the 300 men did anything that they can claim that they did. Can you remember? <laughs> God said to them, go and hear what they are saying in the camp of the enemy. When they go there, Somebody had a dream. He was telling his friend, I had a dream. I saw a loaf of bread. And a loaf of bread fell on the camp of the Midianites. And it broke down. How can a loaf of bread? Did you hear me? A loaf of bread fell on a roof like this. And the roof fell down. Is that reasonable? Then the other person was going to interpret the dream. He said, ah, <laughs> did you say you saw a loaf of bread that fell on this camp and everything fell? That is, that is nothing but the sword of Gideon. 
Because God has handed him the, the whole of Midianite. He has handed him, them over to his hand. That loaf of bread is the sword. Uh -uh. If you want to interpret dream, you didn't even see one iron. You didn't even see a sharp stick. You saw bread. How can you interpret bread to meet sword? Everything looks incongruent. So God said, did you hear that? I have handed them over to you. When you are going, just begin to sing the sword of God, the sword of Gideon. Now, you see, they were not carrying sword. They were only saying the sword of God, the sword of Gideon, the sword of God, the sword of Gideon. How does empty talk become physical sword? But before you know it, the camp of the Midianites, they were hearing a great troop coming. And before you know, they began to, out of fear, they faced one another and began to shoot at one another. And they said, if you are now for Gideon, before you kill me, I will kill you. And they killed themselves. When they finished killing themselves, the other people that remained began to run. They left their camp. They left all the food, everything they had. We don't know what happened to them. And before you know it, everything's finished. What did those 300 people do? Eh? So that no man will take the glory. So that no man will touch God's glory. So that no man will say, my hand has done it. So, but if we determine under God that we are not going to share his glory, what is the positive way of pursuing it? It is to be totally, helplessly, how? Dependent on the Lord. I thank God for Jesus. One of the greatest things I have found with Jesus, everything that Jesus did, all the miracles he did, who remembers his constant testimony? Who knows what Jesus said every time? He said of my own self, I can do nothing. He said, the word that I speak to you, they are not from me. It is my father who dwells in me that is doing his own work. Imagine how a man ran to see Jesus and he fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, good master. What did Jesus do? He accepted it. What did he say? He said, why are you calling me good? No one is good, but who? But God. But let me ask you, is Jesus not good? Is he not God? Why shouldn't he have claimed that? Because once he was found in fashion of a man, he never touches the glory. There was never a time that Jesus did anything and he was putting his hand on his chest. He never. He never shared the glory of the Father. Even though he was entitled to the glory, but he never shared it. And so all through his life, all through his ministry, no matter the power. Even when he raised Lazarus, he said, Father, I know you hear me always, but that these people may know that you are the one who sent me. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus did a miracle somewhere, and when the people saw the miracle, wow, they quickly went everywhere. They said, we, mu we must crown him. We must, crown, we must give him an honorary title. What did Jesus do? He ran away. 
Jesus ran away from touching the glory. He ran away from sharing the glory. He ran away from letting anybody ascribe the glory to him. And so the Bible said, he made himself of what? No reputation. No matter what he did. Even with his disciples, those that were living with him. I remember in John 17, Jesus stood up and said, Father, all that I have, these people know that everything I have comes from you. There was nothing that I have that I did not receive from you. And I did not hide it. They all know that I have nothing apart from what you gave me. I said, Lord Jesus, you are so, so, so transparent to the point that you will not even allow your disciple to have a secret feeling in their heart that you are important. Rather than he sitting down for people to worship him, he rather wash their feet. Because he will not allow anybody to share the glory of his father with him. What is the strategy of walking through open doors that never will shut, that will never be close to me again? That strategy of being completely emptied as never to claim or to touch or to aggregate or ascribe any achievement or any glory or anything to myself. If God keeps seeing me like that, I want to tell you, then there is no limit to what he can entrust to my hand. No limit. When you were not there, several years back, when I was begging God, I said, God, use me, Lord. When we already began to have a vision that there's going to be revival, I've read many books of people who labor for God in revival and all of that. And we're always praying, Lord, who oh, use me, Lord? 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 This prayer was the constant prayer and we prayed with tears. And we went to this village. And in a very short while, please listen, God answered that prayer. I'm telling you a story because I feared what I'm sharing with you today. But I need to share with you because I perceive you also, you have a stake in what God is about to do. Even you also. There may be some of you that God is going to deliberately open a door to, a door of business, such that almost people will wonder, say, how did his fortune suddenly change like that? How did he get into this? How did he get this kind of connection? Because it will baffle men what God will suddenly do for you because he has opened a door to you for the glory of God. Listen to me or listen to me. Such that even if you bring a hundred million naira for the work of God, are you understanding? You will not even feel it. God is able to open such doors effortlessly. But what is God concerned about? That he will not touch the glory. He will not suddenly become arrogant. So God was saying, as we were praying, 
in that meeting, God manifested himself. My wife will bear me record that during that three days of meeting, the Holy Ghost came down. God was moving. We sent people to different villages because we are, we are reaching villages. Some brothers just went to a village. And as they got there, they went to this hamlet. And as they were getting there, the people were weeping and crying because a lady died. And they carried the corpse they were going to bury. They were Muslims. So they were still carrying the corpse in that thing they used. And the brethren said, what's happening? What happened? They said, the woman just died. We don't have time to hear any message. We, are, we don't. Please don't trouble us. We have a problem. And the brothers said, no, stop. God will do a miracle here. And so they prayed. And the woman jumped up and revived. The whole village turned around. Whatever we told them to do, to receive Jesus, they were ready. Another set was coming from this other side. They were coming with miracles. Another one with miracles. Another one. And you know God was doing something wonderful. I was the coordinator. <laughs> you see? I was the coordinator. The work was, you know, things were. And for three days, you could see the power of the Holy Spirit everywhere. Somebody had not received the Holy Ghost for, for three, four years. You don't need to lay hands and say, now, receive the Holy Ghost now. And without doing anything, he realizes and begins to speak in tongues and fall down. We saw sort of things. And then, even when you want to stop a meeting, the Holy Spirit refused. And you see people were praying. The Holy Ghost was just there for days. And I see this is what we are looking for. A Muslim man that was an imam. We went to speak to him. He was arguing, he was arguing, he was arguing. The Holy Spirit said, don't argue with him. Just open the Bible. And as we opened the Bible, we were just reading John 17. This is the boy that I've been arguing that God has no son. God is never born. He cannot born anybody and all of that. Suddenly, Something fell on him, we don't know. He started shivering. He said, ah, ah, how can I be speaking against my Lord like this? Hey, ah, what will I do to be saved? And we led him to know Christ. Immediately, the following morning, instead of going to call the Muslim prayer, because he was the imam of the village, he went and started calling the name of Jesus. And there was poor air. In the, in the mosque. What has happened? What are you doing? He said, we are all deceiving ourselves. Jesus is the way. And he went immediately and wrote in front of his door, born again. You see, we've seen God. And as that was happening, brother, something happened. I have not said it, but something was inside. I was, you know, everywhere people were praying. This one is praying here. This one is doing something else. I'm the supervisor now. I'm walking around. I said, yes. Yes. This is what we ask God for. This is what, Lord, thank you. This, this, is, what I, this is what we demanded that you would do during this meeting. You, yes, you told us. Hallelujah. God is good. You know, while I was doing that, I didn't know that I was beginning to step on, on something terrible. When it was time, I thought that, yes, as a leader of this meeting, I need to dismiss the meeting now. All along, the Holy Spirit will say no. I say no. Whether, whether the Holy Spirit, I'm dismissing this meeting now. I need to take responsibility for people because they need to go back and they have to write the exam tomorrow. I even went and brought the vehicle that they will go into. I've arranged. I started loading them. When the Holy Spirit came 
you know, I just want to kneel down and join the people that are praying. You know that I want to pray with them. I want to stop their prayer. You know, when you want to stop people that are praying, you just go and say, in Jesus' name. That's what I wanted to do. To tell them that, thank you. You people have prayed. You know, let's go. Let's go. We have dismissed the meeting now. We can't be praying again. Let's go. That's what I wanted to do. As I wanted to kneel down, before I could say anything, a spirit of prophecy fell on one sister. I said, Willie, you have touched my work. And you, are, you want to dismiss my people from my presence. You. I have not even used you so much. See how you have become. The only thing that came to my head that afternoon was how God came and told Moses, I had planned to use you. I planned to carry you to that land, but you have not sanctified me before the people. You know, the only reason why Moses didn't get to the land of promise is this matter I'm talking about. It touched the glory. Say, you did not sanctify me before the eyes of the people. you will not get to the land of promise again. I said, ah, I didn't know what happened. I, I saw myself on the floor. I wept. It started raining immediately. I don't know where the rain came from. The rain rained. I was just there on the floor. They were begging me to come out of the rain. I said, no. This rain was to come and beat, <laughs> beat this foolishness out of my head. I stayed there. I was crying and weeping. And when the brethren heard that Bragbile was now crying, all of them also started weeping. So there was a cry throughout the camp for the next four or five hours. Another level of brokenness came, but God was dealing with me. And that day God said, this will have been the end of your life. It was so painful that don't touch God's glory, brother. Whatever we have seen here, God said yesterday, I know your works. There's a divine acknowledgement. Hallelujah. But don't touch his glory. Did you hear me? Never you touch his glory so that you do not truncate what is about to happen. Don't truncate. Did you get the word truncate? And don't short circuit what God is about to do. What God is about to do is beyond where we are now. Where God is going is nobody, none of us have seen it. We can't measure it. We can't handle it. It is only God. The dimension of what God wants to do, only God can measure it. But the first thing to be able to walk into it is to be a man who is helplessly dependent on God enough as never to touch the glory. We were in that place for another, I think from 4 p.m. when this thing struck, we were there at 2 a.m. only weeping and crying. At the end, God was saying, you are begging me to use you. I have whole betrayer of trust. If any of you is going to be part of this work, beyond where you have reached it, you must enter into this covenant with God. I will not touch your glory. Whether you are the one driving the bus everywhere, Never you think that without you, that boss will not move. If God allows you to do that for him, 
It's just because he's giving you a privilege. Never you do what? Touch his glory. I will not fail to tell you another story because this is important. I sense that where we have reached, everything we have done in time past up to today, God is saying it will be completely small compared with what he is opening to us now. If that, if you can have an understanding of that. If it can dawn on you that what God is saying is that everything you have seen so far is too small compared with what we are about to enter. That's the only way I can explain to you. That's the only way I can tell you the kind of thing that we are about to enter into. In every dimension. And for even each one of you. You are going to be part of that. But the first key. Is that you will never. Be strong enough. As to touch God's glory. Ah my God. From that day I began to beg God. Lord please. Please Lord. Then something happened to me again. Something happened to me again. And I want to tell you that also. Because I have an understanding tonight that the greater works and the open doors and the enlargement God is talking about, we will soon enter it but we will enter it as men and women who have no strength. So that God may be the monopolist of his glory. Did you, did you hear what I'm saying? So that none of us, either in our private room, whether between you and your wife, you will not be beating your chest secretly. And say we thank God but we did something. Can God do that for us? Now listen. I tell you this. Because I'm in position to tell you this. Because of where we are going together. And I'm praying that none of you will fall by the wayside. Those of you that are young, that God is bringing to this work at this level, when he begins to open doors for you, never you become a high-headed so that you can last, so that you can live long, so that you can see greater days. There's greater days ahead, greater than what me, I have known. Greater than all my stories. Greater than all the testimonies. What God is about to do is greater than all that we have ever talked about. But something happened. This must have been 1982. These meetings that you are coming every Wednesday for Bible study. In Kasnala in those days, our Bible study, which is our discipleship class, was on Tuesdays. And it starts at 5 p.m. And at 5 p.m., oh God, even though it's not yet so big, and in then I didn't understand what God was going to do, we went and got a 50 by 100 plot. And the Lord was asking me, who told you to buy 50 by 100 for the work I want to do? Your head is not correct. Do you know that what I want to do, there is no space that can contain it. What do you want to do with a plot of 50 by 100? For what? I said, ah. But we have already paid. And it is going to be a problem. So I said, Lord, please take this thing away. Take this thing away. In the middle of the night, as I was praying, 
by 6 a.m., our brother that was in charge of going to collect the papers and all of that, he came. Very furious. He said, Bradbile? I said, what? He said, come and see these people. After they have collected our money, they say they are not selling the land again. <laughs> what kind of people are these? <laughs> he was so annoyed. I was laughing. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, I never slept throughout the night. God had been troubling me that we are buying 50 by 100 for his work. That who told us to do that? So I begged God that the people should come and collect their, their, their land, even if they don't give us money back. He said, well, they have come to take their papers. But they said that they will give us money uh, in two days' time. I said, well, it's okay. If they don't give us the money, it was our deliverance. Such was that God was doing things. At five, you will see people running, running. Oh, my God. I've seen people running for meetings like this. Running. Hey. So when I see people rushing here today, I said, look, here is a meeting that we don't advertise too much. We are not advertising any miracle. Why are people running here now? And it's not as if when they come here, we will catch you there and say that God will make you a millionaire tomorrow. We have not said such kind of thing. And people are coming. Is it not God? So people will be running. You see people park their cars. They are coming. So one day, I got a terrible letter from Ibadan. In that letter, one of my colleagues that I used to lead to those village evangelism where we saw miracles. Are you understanding? He wrote me, he said, Billy, we were thinking that you are going to spearhead what God is starting with us in Ibadan. And you went to that bush. And we are not hearing anything about you. I hope you have no backsliding. What are you doing in that place? When God is already doing something here. For your information, what we started doing together with you when you are here has become something. So what tell me exactly? What are you doing in that place? Ah! There are some dangerous letters that I don't pray you receive. Letters that can, that can change your course overnight. I tell you, what happened to me as I read that letter? I don't know how some, you know, it was on a Tuesday. I was preparing for the Bible study. And I was praying when the letter came. And as I read the letter, I was still on my knees. I said, God, what actually am I doing here? What is all this? Eh? I should have gone to where people are needing my ministry. You tie me down here. I know how many places we went and we saw miracles. I'm here. Nobody is even coming. You know, I was talking and God kept quiet. But then I did something. I said, and the only thing I would say I'm doing is this Bible study. Is this Bible study. You know, as I put my hand like that, I say, is this Bible study? Then I heard God say, are you pointing your finger at my work? So are you the one doing the Bible study? Are you the one bringing people for that Bible study? You will see. I was, oh my God, I've, that you are meeting me today, I know is the mercy of God. That there are some people that you used to know before and you are not seeing them again. Uh, when you meet them and they want to tell the story properly and tell you the truth, they touch something. It doesn't take time to touch the glory. 
So I just did my finger like that. I said, even this Bible study. And God said, you, you are pointing at my work as what you are doing in Benu. So that you can tell somebody who is asking you, what are you even doing there? My own work. You are pointing at it. You will see. Today, you will know that it's not your work. And that nobody comes to that Bible study if I did not bring them. I thought it was a joke. I went for the Bible study. This is a Bible study that before I will arrive, people will have been there. They will have swept the floor. They will have arranged everything. I got there. Quarter to five. Nobody came. I swept the place. I dusted the chair. Nobody arrived. I thought that by five they will come. By five, nobody came. The Lord told me, as I knelt down, I said, I've told you, nobody will hear you again. You are touching my work. Nobody came home. By quarter to six, nobody came. Ten minutes to six, nobody came. As I was now crying, because it's now done on me that I've touched something. I said, God, have mercy on me. God said, well, for you to know that I'm the one who bring people and I'm the one who can tell them to come and not to come. Today, only 10 people will come for this Bible study. Only 10. And they will only arrive at 6. And you are not going to talk to them. I'm not using you today. Just like that. When it remained one minute to six, they started arriving as if they planned it. And by six, ten brothers have arrived. So I thought that since I prayed and God brought ten, maybe God will use me. They started singing. Nobody apologized for coming late. Are you understanding? Can you imagine that I've been sitting there since quarter to five, and they arrived. They didn't even say, I believe we are very sorry for coming. They did what nobody. They just came and sat down as if it's normal. They didn't ask who does the chair. It's not their business. They just sat down. <laughs> so, somebody raised a song, and they were singing. After a while, I said, Lord, since the way they are singing, should I go and lead the meeting? Because they were expecting me to lead. Whenever I stood up to go and say anything, the presence of God will just disappear. You just know that everything is finished again. The people that are singing well before, they will just say, so I change choruses, nothing. God will say, but I've never told you to lead this meeting. Let the brother who was leading the meeting lead it. I go and say, say, brother, please continue the song. Once the brother takes over, the presence of God came back. We did that. When it was 6.30, it became clear to me that God is not going to use me today. So I went and confessed to the people. I said, I'm sorry. I have a problem with God. God is not going to use me today. So let brother this... Just share something with us and then we'll finish. And nobody, none of them said, let's pray for you. Ha! Ah! They took the meeting. The brother shared what he wanted to share. Because we must end at seven. By seven, they were ready to share their grace. They left me there. That's when my trouble started. I said, God, so Now, is this the end? This is the end. You may have finished now. Well, I knelt down to pray, God said to me, he said, you touch my work. If not because I'm going to give you a second chance, your future 
This is the exact word he used. He said, your future will be a defense of your past. What kind of statement is this? That the rest of your life will be a defense of what? Of your past. That means your past will have been your climax. And all the rest of your future, you will only be struggling to defend what you have done before. And what have I done that I will be spending the rest of my years to defend? I cried. I wept to God. I said, Lord, please have mercy on me. He said, yes, I will have mercy on you, but you have to learn this. Nobody touches my work with the hand of the flesh and survive. If you touch my work again, I want to tell you the truth of the matter is that after that day, since I've touched that work, God said, I can do nothing with it. I will kill it. Allow you to die. So that those who are writing from you, from Ibadan, they will know that you are doing nothing. I cannot forget that letter. The brother who wrote me the letter have forgotten that he wrote. It was only three years ago that his, his wife, who is a medical doctor, like your classmate, attended one meeting, whether it's ladies' retreat or MLR, and the woman was overwhelmed Say we have been saying, we don't know what Bragbile is doing. We, 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 we thought he was lost. My husband said, you used to be uh, their leader in the village work. And they didn't hear anything about you again. Only for her to come and saw a very big, big meeting. She couldn't keep quiet. She brought her daughter, who is also a medical doctor, to come and greet me. And that one was saying, this is your father's classmate. That was said, ah, but I've been hearing about him. I didn't even know that my father knows you. I'm going to tell my father, why is he not connected with you again? When I now met the brother, ah, he said, Bragbili, we thank God for what you are doing. We thank God. <laughs> I, was just, I was just looking at his mouth. He had forgotten his letter. The letter that would have killed me long ago. He forgot this letter. So what am I saying? Do you know that that fellowship died? Complete. To the extent that the last day that I will go again before I move back to my house, I went there. 5 p.m. as usual. Not one single person came. I swept the floor completely. I dusted the chairs I used to do. Waiting, nobody came. I sat there. When it was 6 p.m., the Lord said, look, I've told you that this thing has finished. Your work here has finished. Go back to your house and wait for me to have mercy on you. And if I ever start anything with you again, don't touch my work. Don't touch my glory. Touch my glory. I cannot forget that day. I sat in the school, in the primary school. There was this church, the Apostolic Church. They were starting their own uh, fellowship in the primary school. And it was the end of the month. I still remember it was end of May. And they have their own tradition that every end of the month, you come for anointing service so that they will pour oil on your head so that you don't carry misfortune into the next month. <laughs> ah! Where I was sitting and there was nobody coming for Bible study, God said, go and join them. So I carried my Bible, I went and sat there. So when the man of God said, well, 
all the misfortune that has followed you <laughs> throughout the month of May. Come and knead down so that the man of God will use the oil to wash it away so that as you enter into June, you enter with a new life. I first sat like this. I said, ah, I'm a man of God now. How can I? Be? He said, go there, go there. <laughs> it was humiliating. I went and knelt down. That man carried his oil and poured on my head. I went back home. That was the end of the fellowship. I was in the house crying to go and say, Lord, I am too young to be defending my past with the rest of my future. Lord, give me another opportunity. I will not point my finger to your work again. So I was inside when the Lord began. One day, this brother, Emmanuel, came all the way from Makodi. He said, as he was praying, the Lord said, there's a man in Kasina Allah, he should come, and he, that he should come and be fellowshipping with me. I was looking at him, I said, eh, did God tell you like that? <laughs> you mean God has not forgotten me here? So he came. So he would just come to the house. I'll pray with him. He would go back. He was a nurse at the Kasina Allah General Hospital that time. Then he would come, and uh, we will pray together. That's how the prayer meeting started again. All those that used to carry their car and run and run, they didn't even ask me. They didn't explain to me why they were not coming again. You don't understand what I'm talking to you about. Can you imagine that? Here is a fellowship that we have always, we were meeting, we have a, a secretary that will help us take notes and all of that. None of them even had the courtesy of explaining to me why they are not coming again. The whole thing just died and they didn't come again. And we will meet. We will meet in the corridor of the college. Hi, Abra Gile. Hi, Abra David. How are you? This, that, that, that. They will never say, we are not coming to fellowship again because of this. Nobody talked. Everything just died. I knew it was God that killed it. I knew it was God that was doing something because of where he was going. So once this brother started coming, another one came, another one came. So another prime meeting started in the parlor and then it was growing again, growing again. When it started growing again, those other guys started coming back. They are saying, let us organize this thing. I said, no, this is not the one that we used to do before. <laughs> that one died. This one, Please don't touch it. Don't touch it. So what shall we call it? They don't call it anything. Let's just, let just be praying. Praise the Lord. Now what am I telling you? Only one thing can stop this work. What is that? To touch the glory of God. It is not money that will stop this work. It is not opposition that will stop this work. Persecution cannot stop this work. Blackmail cannot stop it. Say, I have set an open door before you which no man can shut. Nobody can shut it. But one thing will shut it immediately. What is that one thing? When you touch his glory. When you share his glory. When you arrogate the glory of God to yourself. When something tells you that you are, you are the one who did something. When quietly, sometimes you know you are talking among yourself. And you seem to be hedging others with your elbow. I say, when did you come here? When did you come here? Uh -uh. Don't touch the glory. But this is important for me to share that with you because God is committed. There's a divine commitment in the heavenlies.
to what God wants to do in our time, with our lives, and in this generation. But God have us betrayer of trust. I even want to tell you, if you embezzle God's money, it's not a problem. If you stole the money from the work of God, I don't think that's a big trouble. Because money, no matter how much it is, it's nothing. It doesn't value as the ayata of the glory of God. The only thing that makes the devil the devil is that he wanted to take the glory. There is no how big, how great a work has grown. When the men that God is using, when they begin to share God's glory, either quietly or privately or secretly or, you know, somehow, something will stop. And when it stops, that will be the beginning of the dismantling of it. Do we want to see the glory of God in the land of the living? Do we want to be involved in a move of God that we shoot forth, break from this little place and go to the far north, to the east, to North Africa, to East Africa, to South Africa, to West Africa coast, all the, and then to go beyond here, go to Asia, go to anywhere else? Do we want to see such a work of God? Only one matter. If God will find men and women who are saying, Lord, no matter what you do, no matter what happens, no matter how big this door, I will not touch the glory. Can I believe God for you for that? I'm spending time on it because if God is sure that he can trust me and trust you. That we will prefer to die than to share his glory. Then there is no limit to which God can go with what he wants to do with our lives. We have come to a threshold of an outburst we have come to the beginning of a greater task than we have ever heard or read about. God is ready. I can see God is mobilized himself to lavish upon us such opening that we have never heard before. I have seen that there are certain things that God has done here in our midst that when you go anywhere all over the country, they are asking me, what did you do to bring us that kind of people to your meeting? What did you do? I didn't do anything. So I know that even the little thing that we are seeing now, they are in the class of things that has never happened anywhere else before. Even the little that we have seen. But, the Holy Ghost is saying, behold, I set before you an open door. For I know you have a little strength and you have not denied my word. You have persevered with my word. You have a little strength. I have set before you an open door.
Nobody must touch the glory of God. Please don't do it. Don't do it. A man came here some years ago. And when he came, he was walking from Bushi to this place. You know then there was no light, no electric pole, nothing. So he walked in, he was doing like this. He was walking like this. He said, yes. We are going to put light in this place. Tell all your electric engineers to tell me how much it will take. And while he was saying that, he also went to my house and there was no light. We were using candle and the lantern. Because our house is in that village, there's not even a pole. And to bring light from the road to our house, we need about 10 to 11 poles. And we're going to buy all the wires. So this man came. Say, Brad Billy, you mean you are living in darkness? I said, what? Why people like us are here? You are living in darkness? No. Tell the electrician to, to give us the cost of all the poles and the wire and everything. Let them send to me. And you know, as I saw one arrogant man, Wanting to do something for God here. The Holy Spirit told me. If this man. Put one pole. One electric pole. Here. He will brag about it. But he was so sure that the contract. That he was expecting money from. Will come that week. And he has determined that he's going to do that so that whenever they come here, they will not see Bragbile in darkness. I told my wife, I said, there's a man who is going to tamper with something here. I'm going to beg God for him. I prayed. I'm sorry for that prayer. I say, oh God, so that this man will not be able to lift a finger. His expectation. Baba, dash it. To the extent that he himself will be begging for bread. So that he may know that nobody can brag in God's work. I don't know whether the prayer was too dangerous. But that was the prayer I prayed. For the next three years, the contract they thought will come on on Tuesday. Three years, nothing. Whenever he comes here, he comes ashamed. Because he spoke so big, he bragged. So when he comes around, he will say, I have not forgotten what I said, but, you know. <laughs> I said, don't worry, don't worry. So I told God, the Father, before he comes next, put light in my house so that he will know that nobody can brag about what God is doing. Will you understand? Can I tell you what happened? This man, he couldn't pull one, one finger. Sometime when I met him and he was struggling, I feel like giving him some money to go and eat. So 
So one day I traveled. And somebody came to the house. A lady came to the house and my wife lodged them. They said they must sleep in my house. They didn't know that we don't have light. So, and they come from air corn houses. So, when they put her, after they switch off the gen, and they put lantern. <laughs> in the middle of the night, she said she knelt and started begging God. Lord, you mean that the source where many of our own lives have been changed. This is where Bragville stays. Please, Lord, if you will help me as my little contribution to contribute to this, Lord, help me. She said she cried to God and then wrote a letter down and said, sir, please, if you will pray that God will help me, since that night, I've not been able to sleep again. I kept being disturbed that there's no light in the house. I've been begging God that God will help me. I don't know what God will do, please. But I'm praying. She left a note like that. We didn't answer. We just prayed and said, Lord, it's okay. She did not ask us the budget and tell your electrician to send me how much they need. No. You know what happened that was like a miracle to me? One day, this sister sent 160,000 naira and said, I don't know whether this will contribute towards the bringing light to the compound. But I just felt I should send, this has just come to my hand, and God reminded me of my prayer. Please help us to use it if you can get light to the house. Then I sent for Brother Chidimek, and he came down. By the time he brought all the things he was going to buy, the temples, the wire, everything, when they finished, it was 158,000 naira. And it remained 2,000 naira that we are going to report back to the person and say, your money has brought the thing and it remained 2,000. Please, sir, don't touch the glory. This work is not our work. It is his work. Don't put your finger on it. Don't use it to describe yourself. It is none of our credentials. You can never see me go anywhere and I want to introduce myself and introduce myself with the work of God. Uh -uh. Do I want to kill myself? My name is Brother Gwilia Kani from Boko. That's all. I went to Malawi for several years. I'll go for their meeting. Maybe sometime there will be 15 people maybe sometimes 20, sometimes 30. And they were always feeling that they are doing me a great favor to come and be ministering to them like that. But to me, it's a privilege, isn't it? For God to even allow me to speak to five people. Until one day, one of the men said, they want to come to Nigeria. I said, all right, would you like to come to Boko? They said, yes, we want to come to Boko. And when he came and he met a meeting, MLR, and he saw thousands, then he said, you mean this is where you have been coming to us? 
and we will put you in one in one room, six spring bed. And when you are spoken to about 20 people, we are always thinking that we have gathered a meeting for you. Hey, you want to kill us? I say, for what? I'm not killing you. <laughs> it's a privilege to speak even to 10 people now. It's the grace of God now. When the man went back, he said, he went to tell all the people, say, you don't know this, brother. I beg you, brothers. Can I beg you one more time? Do not touch the glory. There is no limit to where God wants to go with us. So let's read that Isaiah 40 because that is the positive aspect of that instruction. That instruction has taken me this length of time because the more I pray, I hear God saying, if you don't touch the glory, nobody can stop it. If you don't touch the glory, you will be unstoppable. If you don't touch the glory, you are going far. If you don't touch my glory, nobody can predict how far you are going. If you don't tamper with what I'm doing, if you do not contaminate it with your own pollution, Nobody knows how far you are going. That's why I beg every brother, every sister, whether you are working in Calvary Arrow and you are getting excellent results, don't touch the glory. Don't quietly say, ah, those are my boys, those are our boys. <laughs> don't do that. Though. Otherwise, God will allow them to disgrace you. They will start doing something and your school will become obnoxious. Nobody would like to hear it again. Don't touch the glory. Don't claim anything. The Lord knows your work. Does he know your work? There is a, a divine acknowledgement. God knows what you are doing. So you don't need to talk about it. You don't need to Put it around your name. Just remain the brother that you are. Remain that sister. So that we can live long. So that we can see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. So that we can get to the extent to which God wanted to go with us. So that we do not again cut short what God wants to do. So permit me now to ask you to now go back to that Isaiah 40. Now I want to get it to read from the Amplified Bible. We're reading verse 29. And we'll take it up to verse 31. It gives power to the faint and the weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. He increases strength. Causing it to multiply. Causing it to do what? To multiply. Uh -huh. and making, it making it to abound. Please wait. God, this is what he does. And this is why to walk into this open door, this is the key. This is the strategy. This is something, if I can beg you, even when I hear any of my brothers preach, and I see a little iota of boasting in their voice, I shiver. I say, hey! Does this brother know that he's, he's walking on the edge? Have you ever seen somebody walking on the edge of a bridge? And you can see that the place is like you are going to fall into a terrible dungeon. 
and he's doing like this. He's, you see the way I'm doing now. What will some of you be doing? Say, eh, eh, eh. That's how I fear. When I see anybody beginning to do anything that appears like a quiet boasting. That appears as if he is trying to say this is what we are doing. My friend say, hey! This brother want to tumble. But if only he tumbles and he does not tumble this work that me and him are doing. How do we enter into this great door and these greater works? We will do so if we remain as if we are faint. If we remain weak and weary, it gives power to the faint. Go back to verse 29. It gives power to the faint. Yes, sir. And weary. And weary. And to him who has no might. To him who has no might. He increases strength. Increases strength. Causing it to multiply. Uh And making it to abound. Now, if you are carrying a Bible that has cross reference, you will notice that the cross reference they put there is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. Which means what Isaiah 40, 29 was pointing at was exactly what God came to confront Brother Paul with. He said, my grace is all you need. For my power is made perfect when you are weak. Who needs greater grace to do greater work for God here? Who? Uh Greater grace is for the weakest. Greater manifestation of the power of God is only available when we become weaker and weaker and weaker. So even as I'm hearing God say, I have a greater task for you, I'm taking you to a greater place, I'm moving you into this, I'm moving you into that. I just knew that the only way, the only strategy for me to be part of that is for me to be emptied again. It's for me to become another novice. It's for me to lose whatever control I have had so that God can freely do what he says he wants to do with my life. Brother, go ahead. Even youths shall faint yes, sir. and be weary yes, sir. and selected young men uh-huh. shall feebly stumble uh, uh, uh. and fall exhausted. exhausted. Uh-huh. But those who wait for the Lord. Now, I know the old King James says those who wait on the Lord. I think so. Eh? So, because of that language, we only understood I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. And to many of us, Waiting on God means fasting. Abby? And let's wait on God tomorrow. Let's wait on God tomorrow. What it means that let us fast. I wish you don't just carry a very big Bible verse eh? to decorate an ordinary fasting. I'd like you to fast. But waiting on God is more than fasting. Waiting on God is first waiting for God. Waiting helplessly for God. Waiting completely, totally dependently on God. And if God has not come, you cannot lift a finger. I still want to pray that God will find brothers and sisters here that we allow him to be God. That we allow God to freely manifest himself 
Because there is no iota of the flesh that wants to take the glory. That want to quietly say, well, yes, yes, yes. You know, there are people that are humble physically. But they are very arrogant. Actually, they are very arrogant of their humility. If you see people that are very conscious that they are very humble. <laughs> I know I am very humble. I know I'm very humble. When I hear somebody saying like that, what is he saying? Eh? I am very arrogant. I'm only camouflaging with humility, but I'm very arrogant. That's what he's saying. Humble people don't talk about it. They are simply humble. Hallelujah. Humble people don't even know that they are humble. Because they are looking for a deeper ground to fall. May God not allow you because of a small arrogance to truncate what God wants to do in your life. Brother, please finish. You are in verse 31 now. But those who wait for the Lord. Those who wait for the Lord. Who expect. Who expect. Look for. Who look for. And hope in him. And hope in him. Did you see what it means now to wait on God? Those who wait on God means they wait for him. They are expecting God to help them. They are looking for him. And they are hoping in him. Because they now know that without him, they can go nowhere. Without him, they cannot lift a finger. Without him, nothing will happen. Even though there is going to be a very mighty move of God, they know in themselves that if God did not move, we can move nothing. They know in their heart, if God does not work, every other thing any man is doing is a useless work. That is the strategic key for the coming days. If I can just secure your agreement with me that we will not touch the glory. And each one of you are going about all the opportunities that God will give you, waiting for him, trusting him, depending on him, and, and only allowing God to be the one walking in you, both the way and to do of his good pleasure, I can be sure that we will reach somewhere very fast. How I pray that those of you that are just doing fashion design, I know the danger when you have designed a cloth somewhere and some persons are wearing it. Eh? Eh? You know it is the grace of God that will make people that are important to wear your dress. Eh? How many people are good fashion designers that nobody is wearing their dress? Or even those who buy it, nobody looks at them. But how beautiful it is that God could give you a design and open door for it. I don't know whether you know that it is God that opens door even for you as a fashion designer. That you will just make a dress and maybe somebody who everybody will normally look for has worn that dress. And they say, ah, eh, auntie, where did you get this? He said, ah, it's one sister that made it for me. <laughs> Which sister is that? I will let you know about it. And then she went somewhere again. About 20 people say, ha, ah, did you see the dress that that uh, auntie wore? Hey, that's a wonderful dress. Who made it? She said, it is that sister that made it. Very soon, people are coming to you. They are coming and say, sister, that dress you made for that auntie. Do you remember the clothes she wore when they were preaching? I'm told that you are the one that made it. Can you make for us? 
I want to make uh, that and give a gift to somebody who is going to Lagos. Can you imagine that when God opens doors, even small door like that, your work gets to Lagos. Your work gets to London. Your work gets everywhere. And they say, where did you make it? Say, well, there's one sister. And before you know it, you are getting orders from people of influence. Who can do that? And before you know it, your shop has become popularized. How I beg that you will not truncate. Because as I'm talking to you, when God opens doors, uh -uh, even if you are just selling aqua here, and God decided to bless it, that is what all the Okada riders will be looking for. Eh? You'll be surprised that it is as if you are putting honey in your own. And everybody will be running for it because God has decided to open the door for it. These are the secret things that many people don't know. They think it is by struggling. No. They think it is by contesting with someone else. No. They think it's by opening your, your, your shop against another person's shop. No. When God opens a door to you, Nobody can shut it. But the key to it is what I'm reading to you here. They look for him. They hope in him. They expect him. They wait for him. Yes, brother, you've not finished. Yes? They shall change and renew their strength. They will change and renew their strength and their power. You know when they use the word change? In my mind, it's like you are changing engine oil. Eh? It's like your engine oil has been is exhausted, and then you went and changed it, and your engine becomes fresh. So they will change and renew their strength and their power. Yes, sir. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God uh -huh. as eagles. Mount up to the sun. Yes. They shall run and not be weary. They will run. They will not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or they become tired. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. That is a key. This key is still what God is saying. You will become unstoppable if you don't stop yourself. What is it that will stop a man here? When he touches the glory of God. So I'm going to lead you to pray. Because as far as I know, nothing that God has said that he wants to do with us is impossible. And when God begins to work in your life, it's unstoppable. And where God wants to advance you to, nobody can stop it. All the provisions for it to come to pass, they are already in store. But some of you, you know what stopped you several times. When any little thing begins to happen, you quickly say, God, stop it, stop it. I know what I'm doing. And God said, ah! He has stopped me again. Let's wait until he's exhausted. Let's wait until his power finishes. So that if he needs help, we can come in. I don't want God to wait for me. I am the one who must wait for him. I don't want God to have a reason to dismantle what he's doing with us. It's better for me to die than for me to stop what God wants to do. It's more honorable, isn't it? It's more honorable just to die and be packed and go to heaven before you spoil things rather than spoil the great things that God wants to do. And I'm watching how the Lord must help us. 
I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will help you as an individual. Did you get that first strategy? It is the strongest of it. All other strategies that I will talk about, they are derivatives. They are, once this is settled, all others will fall into their place. What is the next strategy? The strategy of faith. These open doors that God is setting, we can only walk into it. How? By faith. All the people that subdue nations, all the people that God allowed them to shift the boundaries of the kingdom a distance, all the people that have obtained a good report, the Bible said they did so how? By faith. The Lord Jesus was teaching his disciples something which I thought we discussed here just before we went to MLR, and it has occurred to me again. Jesus said, you remember he spoke to a fig tree one day, and the fig tree dried up. Do you remember? And Peter, the following day, said, sir, the tree you spoke to yesterday has withered from roots. And he just said, yes. Have faith in God. Do you remember that? Have faith in God. For verily, verily, I say unto you. Can somebody read that for us? Mark 11, 22 and 23. We will read verse 24 differently. But let's read 11, 22 to 23. Uh-huh. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. God. For verily I say unto you, Verily I say unto you, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Whosoever. What's the meaning of whosoever? Eh? Anyone at all. Does whosoever include me? Does it include you? I say to you, sister, start again. And Jesus answering said unto them, Unto them, Have faith in God. Yes, sir. For verily I say unto you, Uh That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Unto this mountain, Be thou removed, Uh And be thou cast into the sea, Uh And shall not doubt in his heart, Uh But shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. Yes. He shall have whatsoever he said. He shall have many of the things he says. Is that what the Bible said? (laughs) What the Bible say? Whatsoever he says. Whatsoever he says. He shall have it. This is Jesus talking. But I want you to see that key. Have faith. In who? In God. You see, to walk into what God has said, no matter how bogus it is sounding in your ears, the way into it when you have settled the first issue I've raised the next key is faith in God faith not in yourself in the first place faith not in your faith because some of you are here and say have faith in your faith have faith in your faith I don't know where they found that bible So many motivational speakers say many things that are not in the Bible. He didn't say have faith in your faith. And he did not say have faith in yourself. What did he say? Have faith in God. What does it mean to have faith in God? It means to take God by what he says. It means to know that God cannot lie. And that anything that God has said that has to do with you, 
and you have believed God, nothing will be impossible to that man who has chosen to believe. Now, when he says, have faith in God, he now said, verily, verily, I say to you. Newer versions say, most assuredly, I say to you. That whosoever of you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. But shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. But I want you to note that that verse 23 is premised on verse 22. What is verse 22? Have faith in God. So that's why verse 23 is not an empty positive talk. It is not an empty, positive confession. It is not that you just woke up and said, I'm going to be a millionaire by next year. That's not what we are talking about here. On what basis are you making that statement? Have faith in God. The reason is because whatsoever you declare, you are only declaring it for God to do what? To cause it to happen. That key of believing God to bring to pass what he has spoken to you which you have declared is the key. So may I now say to you, everything that God has been speaking about of the greater things that he wants to do, of the large thing that we are going to walk into, of the glorious manifestation of his power that you will see, somebody may be asking, hey, how does that brother, who, 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 what does he mean? What does he mean? What does he mean? That's what I mean. That's what I mean. You will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. But Jesus said, if you believe. I have chosen to believe God. You know, I said, please follow me to believe God yesterday. Did you remember I said that repeatedly? I said, please follow me to believe God. Don't, don't, don't stay somewhere else. Let's go and believe God together. Let's take God by his word together. And now, he said, have faith in God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever. And brothers and sisters, this whosoever meant any one of us at all. Any one of you at all who choose to believe God. Who choose to have faith in this God we are talking about. Who choose to rest in the authority that God releases by his word. Emmanuel, will you have faith in God for what God is saying? Eh? That is it. Have faith in God. Whatsoever you say, even if you say to a mountain, and you do not doubt in your heart that God will make it good, you will have whatsoever you, you, you say. Have faith in God. Can I hold a bit there and make you to read some more verses so that you can understand what we are dealing with? Will you go to Mark 9? Mark 9. I want you just to catch that. But from Mark 9, we will go to Matthew chapter 17. In Mark 9, when Jesus had gone to the Mount of Transfiguration and the people while he was away he left nine of his disciples now go to verse 14 and when he came to his disciples he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them 
And straight away, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? What are you querying them about? What is the matter? Now, I wanted to hear what they said. I remember that we were sharing this, but because it's a key, it's a strategic key for where we are going with God. That's why we are going on it again. Look at it. And he said, what question ye them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto you my son, which has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he tears him, and he foameth, and he gnashes with his teeth, and pines away. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Now, did you understand the question? What are you questioning them? Why are you arguing with them? And the man was so bold. He said, Master, I brought my son who was epileptic, a dumb spirit, to you. And they said, you are not around. And I said, okay, if you are not around, and they have been with you for these three years, I was expecting that they should be able to do what? Cast this demon out. And they have been here pulling his neck, pulling his leg, and they could not cast it out. That's why we are arguing with them. So I was wondering, say, hey, people will come tomorrow and begin to fight you. They say, you have been in peace house. And you can't do something. A stage is coming when people's expectation of what God should do with your life will become an argument. When they will be asking, so why are you always there if you are catching nothing? That's why I'm trusting God that the Holy Spirit will activate something in your own life as well in the name of Jesus Christ. Now the Bible said, Jesus said to them, bring him to me. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. When they brought him, and when he saw him straight away, the spirit tore him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed for me. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came to him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can do anything, are you noting verse 22? But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Did you see Jesus' answer? What was Jesus' answer in verse 23? And Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, You know the man is saying, if thou canst do anything. But the question is not whether Jesus can do anything. The matter is not whether God can do anything. That's not the question. What is the matter? He said, if you can believe. I don't want you to miss that point because it's a key word here. If you can believe, what did Jesus say? How many things? A what? To who? That believes. Brother, it is not if God can do anything. Don't say it like that again. Don't say, if God can help me, if God can do something, if God can heal me, if God can provide. No, it is not if God can. 
That's not the question. The only question that is here today is what? If you can believe. For all things are possible to him. I want you to see the word there. Did you notice it said, all things are possible to him that believes. All things are possible. There's no impossibility when a man can believe God. Are you hearing me? How are we going to walk into these things that God is talking about if you can do what? Believe God. All things, there's nothing that shall be impossible to a man who chooses to believe God. If we rise from this meeting and you choose to believe God, you will see God. You will see the glory of God. It is not if God can. It is not if God can do it. If God can do it. No, 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 no. There's nothing God cannot do. The only thing God cannot do is to do something for a man who cannot believe. Jesus went somewhere and the Bible said he did not do much miracles there. Why? Why? Because of their unbelief. Unbelief ties God's hand. Unbelief cut short everything that God could have done for you. All things are possible to him who can believe, who believes. Now look at the word of God. I want you to, to, to see the word of God before I move out. So the man quickly responded. He said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. He was very honest. He was saying, Lord, I believe, but <laughs> there's some little, little, little unbelief that is troubling me. Help me. Did God help him? He helped him. God is going to help somebody here tonight. God is going to help your faith. I started praying the other day that God, please don't let unbelief cripple any of these brothers. Don't let any of them say, hey, can that thing even be like that other man? When they declare that by this time tomorrow, that looked an impossible declaration, but it happened. Don't join unbelief. Don't say, eh, 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 can it happen? Don't say that again. Withdraw all your declaration of unbelief. Withdraw it. And rather say, Lord, I believe. May God help you to believe God. Amen. Amen. But that's not where I'm going for this time. I want to go somewhere that I want you to mark and see it. And I want you to go and check that because it became clearer to me in Matthew 17. Can you go to Matthew 17? In verse 19, after Jesus had done the miracle and the man has carried his child and he has gone home dancing, the disciples have a problem. They came to Jesus, then verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart. If you read it from another version, is anybody reading it from New King James or any other version? How did verse 19 put it? They came to Jesus privately. The public crowd has gone now. When they got home privately, the disciples, they came to Jesus. And they were asking a question. Can you please read it for me now from the New King James? 17. Then the disciples came to him privately and said, Yes. Why could we not cast it out? Why could we not cast it out? I want all of you to listen now. 
Why could we not cast it out? Uh -huh. So Jesus said to them, uh -huh. because of your own belief. Because you are young. Eh? Because you are a recent convert. Be answering my question. No. Because you are not experienced. Because you've never cast such a demon out before. Because you have just joined discipleship. Is that the answer? Because God does not want to use you. Talk to me. Is that the answer? What did Jesus say? Because of your own belief. What made that demon to be standing like that is not because the demon is strong. It's not because the demon is very stubborn. What has made us not to be able to cast him out? Because of your unbelief. He did not even say because of unbelief. Can you read it properly? Because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. It is not because of anything. It's not because there's no power in heaven. It's not because God is tired of working. It's not because you are young. It's not because you are not experienced. It's not because you are not one of the top leaders. It's not because you are not an evangelist. No! Only one reason why you couldn't cast him out. Your unbelief. Uh -huh. For assuredly, I say to you. Assuredly, I say unto you. If you have faith, uh -huh. as a mustard seed. Now, some say, we don't have big faith. Jesus said, we are not talking of big. Even if your faith is as small as what? As a grain of mustard seed. The day I saw mustard seed, that was the day I appreciated what Jesus was saying. I discovered that mustard seed is smaller than tomato seed. Are you hearing me? Mustard seed is so tiny that by the time you carry mustard seed and put it around tomato seed, tomato will be about twice or three times of it. You cannot even put mustard seed in your teeth and say you are chewing it. It will have entered your teeth. Even if you have faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, yes? You will say to this mountain, uh -huh. move yes. from here to there, uh -huh. and it will move, yes. and nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing. Do we want to see the glory of God? Do you want to be part of the things that we have been declaring since God began to speak to us? I want to ask you to do one thing. Have faith in God. Am I saying have big faith? Did I ask you to have big faith? I would say have a large faith. I would say have Mighty faith. Am I asking you to have overcoming faith? Eh? All of those appellations, they are human appellations. God has never put it there. He simply said, if you have faith as small as the grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will do. And nothing. Did he say nothing? Did you read something like nothing? Nothing shall what? Shall be impossible for you. Can I beg God to, to visit me and you with the spirit of faith tonight? Faith in God. Now some of you thought you have faith in God. But honestly, I, I, I want to confess to you that it is not true. 
Some of you, your faith is in people. Some of you, your faith is in project. Some of you, your faith is in your feeling. Some of us, your faith only looks faith when you see people surrounding you. Sometimes it is when you see God, people gathering, then your faith say yes, yes, and believe God that something will come. Why do you do that? Sometimes when I say preacher, your faith is not in God, it's in your congregation. That's why you are looking at them. That's why you are very jittery. That's why you are feeling that if they don't come, your support will scatter. Hey. Maybe that's why you are not seen when good comes. Maybe that's why you are stranded. Have faith in God. So Jesus said, look, this is because of your unbelief. But now, if you will believe God, Nothing will be impossible to you. What is the third key? Because I'm only dealing with what is fundamental. If you will only follow this, nobody can predict how far you are going. Nobody can stop you. Because God has spoken. So I said before you an open door which no man can shut. Praise the Lord. What is the next key? Verse 21 of that Matthew 17. What is verse 21? I'll be it. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. But I want to carry it now from Mark 11. Because it is in Mark 11 that this was stated chronologically. Can we now go to Mark 11, verse 24? Mark 11, 24. We are now talking about the key of prayer and fasting. I was going to add fasting to your understanding if the Lord will help me. I want you to note how I've arranged them and I've arranged them in the order and in the scale of importance. Are you hearing me? What is the first? A helpless total dependence on God that makes you to wait for God to act never touching his glory. I spent all the time on it because it is the most crucial. Why did I say that? Even if you have become this kind of helpless man I'm talking about, and all you can only say is, hmm, God, help me. Are you hearing me? That prayer, that little sigh is stronger are more effective than the man that is gyrating everyone and saying, yara ba 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 ye ka 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 ya 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 you know even the way he's doing he shows that he's a very strong man he's, you know he's doing like that and say God as I'm talking to you you must listen to me oh God you see I'm talking to you and I'm dealing with this matter 21 days yes 21 days he even boasts about his 21-day prayer and fasting. That man is unfortunate. Everyone doesn't look at him because he's strong. If God does something for him now, he will take the glory and put it on his what? On his prayer. So when I meet even prayer warriors, 
Sometimes I'm afraid of them. Because they have idolized prayer. It is no more God they are trusting. They are trusting in their prayer. So when you meet them, say, brother, there's no problem. Seven days will settle it. Seven days dry, we finish it. I hope you understand what they are talking about. Yes. Yes. How will the devil not be dealing with you when every day you are digging your grave with the fork and knife? Eh? Can you hope to be great and you are eating jabu, 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 jabu everywhere you are eating? Eh? When you have not brought, you know, a shiny face to face the devil. You think he will run from you? The devil just don't run from anybody anyhow. Those who know how to bulldoze. Uh-huh. Well, when you are ready, come. But get ready seven days dry. The devil that will attack you is not yet born. (laughs) Ah, When I hear such, I say, this is why there's so many activity, so much noise, so much drama, but little. Little. Even if something happens, they will take the glory. Mm -mm. but the fact that some people are doing that does not nullify this key that I want to tell you now what is that key? prayer and fasting but it does not come over and above faith in God prayer and fasting does not replace faith Actually, prayer and fasting only works when it is contexted in faith in God. Am I communicating with you now? Whereas faith in God can work even without prayer and fasting. But prayer and fasting cannot produce anything if it is not a prayer of faith. Am I communicating with you now? So, that third key that we need to carry as we move into this year, God introduced it to us at the NIVG when we read Isaiah 45 verse 11. I want to pack that now together with Mark eleven twenty four. What did Mark eleven twenty four say? If you are reading for us, please. Therefore, yes. I say to you, what things soever you desire, what you desire when, you pray, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them, and you shall have them, and you will have them. This prayer is a prayer of faith. It's a prayer believing that you have them. Let's quickly search this key of prayer because we are going to pray much this year. Because that's the key that God is leaving us with. Can we trace more of this prayer? Can we try? Right. That verse 24 said, And I say to you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall do what? You shall have them. Did you keep that at the back of your hand? Eh? Now, 
Go to John, John 15, verse 7 and verse 16. John 15, 7 and 16. Before we go to 16, right? If you abide in me. Yes, sir. And my words abide in you. Uh You will ask what you desire. Yes. And it shall be done for you. It shall be done for you. Prayer is the next key of entry into all that God is speaking to us about. But what kind of prayer? Believing prayer. Prayer that is coming out of an abiding relationship with the Lord. Go ahead. Verse 16, please. You did not choose me. Yes. But I chose you. I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Uh And that your fruit should remain. Yes. That whatever you ask. That whatsoever you ask of the Father. In my name. Uh Uh-huh. He may give you. He will give it to you. The key of asking God. What sin soever. And I want to remind you that. Murmuring with people. Complaining about government. Is not equal to prayer. Will you. Someone from this other side. Read James for me. James chapter 4. Very quickly. James 4 verse 2 and verse 3. Yes, the sister there. What are you reading for me? James 4. James 4. Yes, verse 2. Verse 2 and 3. You want want something. You want something. But don't get it. But you don't get it. You kill and covet. Hey, but you cannot have what you want. You cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. You don't have simply because you did not ask God. Yes? When you ask, when you ask, you do not receive. Uh-huh. Because you ask with wrong motive. You ask with wrong motive. That you may spend what you get. On your pleasures. You see. That is the only problem. The first problem is that. You don't ask God. You quarrel. You fight. You struggle with somebody. That's not your problem. Stop struggling with somebody. Ask God for it. But when you begin to ask God, make sure that you are asking not according to the pleasure and the desires and the lusts. Ask something that will bring glory to God. Even the thing that you never ask for, God will give you. Is there any other version that can make it clearer? Yes. Living Bible. Uh You want what you don't have. Yes. So you kill to get it. Wow. You long for what others have and can't afford it. Yes. So you start a fight to take it away from them. You start a fight for it. And yet, the reason you don't have what you want... The reason you you don't have what you want... Is that you don't ask God for it. Is because you've not asked God for it. And even when you do ask... Yes. You don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Are you getting that? The only reason why you don't have what you don't have is that you've never asked God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because all you are asking for is what will give you your own pleasure so that you can consume it on your lust. You are not praying for something that we benefit the kingdom of God. You are not asking for something that God himself will say, yes, this man is concerned about what I'm doing on earth. 
So it looks as if God is stingy to bless you. It's because you've never asked God. This third key, the key of prayer. But I have added, as Jesus added, prayer and what? Fasting. But this prayer and fasting, they are only based on faith in God. Praise the Lord. Now, when you go to read from the passage we read before, Isaiah 45, verse 11. Who reads that for us? Because I think these are the three keys I would be able to deal with and leave you so that we go from there. Yes? The Holy One of Israel, Israel's creator, mm-hmm. says, what right, what right have you to question what I do? Mm-hmm. Who are you to command me concerning the work of my hands? Uh -uh. I have made the earth and created man upon it. With my hands, I have stretched out the heavens and commanded all the vast myriads of stars. I have raised up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose, and I will direct all his paths. Mm. He shall restore my city and free my captive people, and not for a reward. All right, thank you. But the passage we are looking for, you know, that verse 11 has raised an issue for us. Even though, according to the Living Bible that our sister is reading, it was coming from verse 10, that those who are struggling with God, those who are quarreling with God, those who are saying, what have you made? They are the ones that God is saying, who are you to query me that I'm, I want to use Cyrus? I've chosen him. But you see, when you cast that passage in the context of verse 11 that we are coming from, he said, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, his maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. Now, if we pick it at that point alone and there are no other passages that we can trace in the word of God where God gave us the right to ask him concerning the work of his hand, it will look wrong. And it will have been only interpreted like uh, the paraphrased Bible has put it. And say, who are you to be asking me? I've chosen Cyrus. Who are you to be saying, why am I using him? But when you pick that passage here and there from other places, then you see God saying the same thing. Can you go to Psalm chapter 2? Will you read Psalm 2 for me? And verse 8. Yes, sir. New King James. Yes, sir. Ask me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Ask me, and I shall give you the hidden for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth for your possession. And the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask me for it. When you go to Zechariah 10, you hear God saying, ask me for rain in the time of the latter rain. Praise the Lord. God has given us liberty to do what? To ask him. Particularly when it concerns the work of his hands. Particularly when it concerns the kingdom of God. Particularly when it fits into his will. He said, ask me. Whatsoever you will ask when you pray, it shall be done to you. Believe that you have received it and you will have them. The John 16 that we did not already said, Jesus said, if that you have not asked me anything, ask whatsoever you will. In 
my name, my father will do it for you. And as you go on and on and on and on, you will see the key of prayer. Three issues that we are going to begin to work with. Number one, all that God said he wants to do now, all the doors that God said he was going to set before you and open now, nothing can stop it. No one can shut it. The only thing that can stop it is if you touch his glory. You will be praying with me tonight, Lord, we will not touch your glory. For the things you want to do in our day, the things you want to do with my life, I will not touch your glory. I will be completely dependent on you. Every strength that will make me to boast, take it away. When you go and read 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing the Corinthians. I said, do you not see why God had not brought uh, big people, highly intellectual? It is so that no flesh will glory in his sight. It is not that God does not use highly intelligent people. He does, but he does something to them. What does he do to them? He brings them low so that they will see the emptiness of their intelligence for God to use them. And it is not as if God specializes in using illiterates. The illiterate that is arrogant is of no use to God. Hallelujah. Any man who trembles at my word is the man that God looks at, not those who trample at the word of God. You'll be wondering, so what am I going to do? Have faith in God. Take God by his word. When he says, I have opened that door to you, go there. Believe God. The people you used to speak to and they normally argue with you, the things have changed. He who holds the key has opened the door. Have faith in God. Follow God and see what he wants to do with you in this present age. The third key. The key of what? Prayer. And fasting. Fasting, first and foremost, for the heavens to open, for your eyes of understanding to open to the word of God. Fasting as a way of life. To seek God's face. Not fasting as if power and God is bound by it. No. Fasting to prepare our heart, to prepare our lives so that God can freely walk with us. And if God begins to call you to wait on him, to forgo food for a while, because of what he wants to do through you, it will be your privilege. Will it? Yes. We're going to pray together tonight. This is where we are ending our visions. The biggest burden that I came with between yesterday and today is that God kept saying, and for what I'm talking about, I only need men of little strength. And for you not to truncate my move, don't touch my glory. And I want to send you forth into this year and into this decade where God is going to do great and mighty things. Where even through your own hand alone, doors God will open to you. And I do not limit that door just to the door of preaching. I mean door into everywhere. I said by God's grace, some of you, you have great breakthroughs in your research that will baffle men. God will lend you secrets. He will lead you into the secret of things that people will wonder, where did you get that? And the only answer will be 
God has done it. Don't truncate what God wants to do, please. Even as a young girl, you may go somewhere and the Lord begins to walk through you. Don't take the glory. Don't stop it. The way God is going to move this time, God is going to move through you, through me, through anybody. And there is no, nobody is going to take glory of it. It will be God walking. You might go somewhere and the Lord just decide to walk a miracle. We are not going to tamper with it. Go ahead. But you, please, don't touch the glory. I told you that long story because I was wondering what my life would have been if since the 1982 my heavens have closed and they say the rest of your years you'll be defending your past. I wonder what kind of man I would have been. And how can any man that I find who is arrogant is unfortunate. And I used to wonder that, ah, how can a young man like you, you have not done far. Why are you arrogant? Why do you want to stagnate yourself too early? What are you bragging about? Are you a young preacher? Why are you arrogant that you can't sit down and keep growing? What has God done in your life yet that you are bragging? Why? Why, why is your poster everywhere on the street? I wonder. What do you want to achieve by that? Why are you learning wrong things? Why can't you look at Jesus so that you can endure? And I speak to you as disciples. Don't touch the glory. We are going far. When I say we are, I meant even you. We are going beyond where we are now. But I beg you, I charge you in the name of the Lord, never you touch the glory. Don't truncate yourself. Don't short circuit what God wants to do. The time ahead of us is much more than what we have behind. A glory is coming that we have not seen. And it's not going to be too far. God is signaling it again and again and again and again. He's drawing people from all over the nations of the earth and say, go to Boko. Don't truncate what God wants to do through you. As I call on you to pray today. It was in 1984 we did a meeting in Kasnala. We call it Solemn Assembly. And as we were preparing for that meeting because that was the first of the kind of conference that we particularly organized. Before then we had gone to speak in other people's conferences and I see the struggle of the natural man, how everybody is struggling with something or the other. And the Holy Spirit, when we were preparing for that meeting, he brought me a song. I remember myself, my wife, we were praying, we were waiting in one house in Gado. Is it Gado stairs? We were praying and waiting on God for three days. And as we were praying, he brought a song. I never knew it yet. So we have to study the music to get it. I have taught that song over and over again since that 1984. And we sang it over and over again. I will be ending this meeting with it. Because at that very beginning, God said, if you will want to have the, the Savior from heaven, Walk by your side from morning to the evening. If you want to experience an unlimited anointing of God on your life, there is a rule 
that each day you must follow. Humble yourself to walk with God. Just as the Lord walks with men of old in the early times and he moved with the prophets and the sages, he will come now if you meet the condition. Humble yourself to walk with God. Humble yourself and he will draw near you. Humble yourself and his presence will cheer you. He will not walk with the proud or discomfort. Humble yourself to walk with God. We had to sing that song and sang it again and again and again. When we go for that meeting, I don't know why. We will take that song at 8 a.m. one day and nobody could stop. People were coming out confessing how arrogant they have been till 4 p.m. We couldn't eat. We couldn't do anything. And I said, God, why are you doing this? He said, that is the rule that each day you must follow. And I felt again like sharing with you that at this threshold of a breaking forth, there is a rule that each day you must follow. What is that rule? Humble thyself to walk with God. I'm going to stop on this tonight. If I make an altar call tonight, don't let pride make you stay back. Don't look left and right and say, people will think I've not been serious. That's not about you. People, if God is asking you that quiet, quiet areas where pride is locking in your heart, pride that makes you unteachable, Pride that makes you size people up and say, this one, at least I'm older than him five years. Pride of life that will not let you sit down and, and get correct instruction for your life. Pride that makes you to think nobody can talk to you. You're a big man of God already. I speak to you tonight as one who is longing for a greater glory. There is a rule that each day you must follow. Humble yourself tonight to walk with God. Are you strong to such a point that you boast even about your prayer life? Do you boast that for the past five years you have never sinned? Are you the one saying, yes, I don't know what a woman is. Because God has helped you. You are not arrogant. I just pray that God will not strike you down. When you will see yourself misbehaving to an extent that will become an embarrassment to you and your family. Because you are arrogant. He will not walk with the proud or the scornful. Humble thyself to walk with God. Can you rise in prayer with me? Humble thyself and the Lord will draw near thee. Humble thyself and his presence shall cheer thee. He will not walk with the proud or the scornful. Humble thyself to walk with God. If thou was out the dear Savior from heaven, walk by thy side from the morn to the even. There is a rule that each day you must follow. Humble thyself 
to walk with God. All but thyself and the Lord will draw near thee. All but thyself and his presence shall cheer thee. He will not walk with the proud or the scornful. Humble thyself to walk with God. Did you see how you have truncated what God could have done through you? Great things could have happened. Greater things than you have ever seen. But there is this presumption. There's this matter that will not let God walk with you. Sometimes you think it is boldness, but it is, it, is, it is that man inside, that arrogance. That thing has not allowed God to take you to where you are going. I speak with you, my dear brother, tonight. I speak with you from the very depth of my heart. Don't truncate yourself anymore. When God begins to walk with you, you see yourself quietly boasting about it. You quietly arrogate and allocate something to yourself about it. Can I ask you tonight? Please humble thyself before God. Please do. Don't look around and say, people will think I have problem. People is not the matter. Don't let God, don't let him see a little iota of arrogance, of touching his glory. Sometimes because God began to do something through you, you began to talk about it as if it came from you. You began to put your finger on what God is doing. That's why God allowed you. God allowed you to, 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 to stumble so that you are disgraced. Don't let God do it again. Don't let it happen again. Is there someone who is the Holy Spirit is saying, humble yourself tonight. I just feel we should end this meeting by recommitting ourselves to God and say, Lord, I will not touch your glory. That thing that makes you, you know, something makes you feel that I'm, 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 I'm confident in myself. I beg you, my dear brother, I just beg you. I think I'm going to go far with several of you by the grace of God. I plead with you tonight. I beseech you by the mercies of God. Humble yourself before God. Don't let it be that God have to, have to humiliate you. Let it not be that God have to pull you down. Don't let God stagnate you anymore. Please, I beg you in the name of the Lord, humble thyself, humble thyself. Humble thyself. Tell God, just tell God, Lord, don't don't peg me like this. I'm too young. I've not even gone far. What is this unfortunate arrogance? What is it that I'm boasting about? Is it, what is it? What do I have? What do I have? What do I have? What am I that I'm finding myself struggling with God? Why is it walking quietly in my heart? Please obey God tonight. I just stop at this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray together. Just tell God. Just tell God tonight. I just want you to please have mercy on me. Can you imagine that some of you God wanted to give you first class? But you began to be arrogant quietly in your heart. 
and that's how you drop down to second class lower. What you have now is not what you should have been. Quiet arrogance brought you down. Can you beg God and say, Lord, it happened before, it won't happen again. Have mercy on me. Give me another chance. I don't know what will have happened to my life if God did not intervene. How will I have been? What have I got that I'll be bra bragging about? And what do you have that you did not receive, my brother? Sister, can you tell God this night? I will not take your glory. If you will give me another chance, Lord. If you open another door for me. Thank you. Thank you. We are praying. Thank you. Maybe you want to stay calm down and kneel before God. And let it be on record tonight. That you are saying, Father. Whatever area where I found myself, quietly, quietly, quietly touching what I ought not to touch. Drawing myself where I ought not to. Lord, tonight have mercy on me. Just plead with God. Plead with God to uproot it. The work of God cannot progress when somebody is sharing his glory. Holy Spirit, please have your way. It's a root that God must uproot tonight. Every manifestation of pride And it takes different form, different shape. God bless you tonight. It's okay. It's okay. We're praying. I'm praying with you now. Let's pray together. If you are standing where you are, and the Holy Spirit is saying tonight, just go and lay down that life. Just lay it down. Just tell God that this night, this night you can see my heart. I want you to have your way with me tonight. Let's pray together. Please lift up your hands to God tonight. There are great things that God wants to do. There are great extent to which God wants to go. What you have seen so far is nothing compared with what God wants to do. You are too young to begin to tell a story. Lord, tonight, tonight we surrender to you. Lord, tonight, Tonight, Lord, I just first want to plead tonight, Lord, tonight. I just plead with you tonight. If it is not by your mercy, where could we start? Every internal, internal arrogance, every quiet <laughs> desire to touch your glory, Please forgive us tonight. Lord, please, I plead so that what you are saying concerning us will not be truncated. Please have mercy on us tonight. Lord, I know, I know, I know that if you don't help a man, the temptation to touch your glory is too hard. 
Sometimes we thought your glory claim me. Say, I'm the one who discipled that man. The work that only you did, we want to use it to become our credential. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, I know you spoke to us from the depth of your heart because you don't want us to miss it. I know you went to this elaborate extent tonight because you want us to actually be part of what you want to do. I know that the reason why you open your heart to us the way you are doing tonight is because nothing else could have stopped you from walking except this matter. This night, Lord, we plead for your mercy. Please give us another chance. Let the fear of God fall on our faces. Lord, Lord, strike our heart. Make our heart never, never to desire glory. Whatever you will do through us, Lord, glory will be yours. When you taught us how to pray, at the end of that prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, said, Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever and ever. Lord, glory is yours. Jesus, our Lord, never touched the glory. Even though he is equal with God, he never touched the glory. Who are we, Lord? What we did not do. How could we claim anything for him? Some of us, our arrogance makes us always angry with people because we are thinking they don't respect us. Lord, tonight... Put your finger on this matter. Since you want to include us in this matter for a while, you want us to be part of that glory coming. Please, Lord, this is a deep work that only you can do. Do it for us. As we rise tonight, circumcise our heart permanently. Amen. God, cut it, cut it off completely. Lord, some of us, I know, I know the kind of outburst that we will have experienced. But because of this, whenever you, you smell it, you detest it. You say, no, 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 we can't use this man again. God tonight as we kneel before you, as we stand before you, as we lift up our hands to you please Lord let your mercy prevail Amen. let that desire to be known to be, to be respected to be honored let it be, let it be take away from us Amen. Lord, for these doors that you have spoken about, you are saying to us, if we don't touch your glory, there is no limit to which you are going. It's an unstoppable move you are starting now. But Lord, help us never to stop you, O oh God. I commit these brothers of mine to you, these sisters of mine, these disciples that you have raised by yourself. Don't let that spirit that makes Satan, Satan, don't let it be found among us. Amen. Don't let this work become bastardized. Amen. Lord, I beg you that whatever you will do, 
even if you are going to give us helicopter and uh, uh, aircraft to be preaching and be dropping tracks here and there, it will never enter our head. Amen. Lord, make us simple. And for these brothers that have taken upon themselves, these sisters that ran out to say to God, I have this need. Please, listen to our cry. Amen. Visit them deliberately. Amen. Let this meeting mark the turning point. Amen. And I want to now pray, oh God, is there anyone that you already pegged? Father, tonight, in your mercy, Open the way again. Amen. Those that used to have utterance and the thing just dried. Tonight, Lord, restore it. Amen. Those that have opportunity to have seen something great, but because of this matter, it just doing to and became small. Give us another chance. Amen. Lord, for this meeting, for this land, for this land, oh God, one of the strongest issues that you have battled with in this land, in our land, is pride of life. Is that spirit of independence. God, since Jesus had come to our lives, that trace must not be traced to us again. Amen. Please cut it off. Amen. Lord, I beg that this decade, let it be an unlimited move of God. Amen. That in offices, in different ways where you are going to open doors for your children, let nothing stop it again. Amen. Thank you for, to, for tonight. Lord, as we rise to go, bring increase to this meeting. Amen. Increase our faith to walk with you. Amen. Pour to us the spirit of prayer. Amen. The spirit of supplication. Amen. That life that is completely dependent on God and God alone, please help us to walk into it. Amen. And Lord, as peace house, we beg you, don't allow this work to disappoint you. Amen. Don't allow any of our leaders to touch your glory. Amen. You told Solomon, Solomon built a big temple. You told him, the day you touch my glory, the day you turn to worship idols, I will turn my back on this place and it will become a byword. And it happened. Everything was broken down. Those costly equipment were used for nothing because they touch your glory. Lord, we will not touch your glory. Amen. It is not for our sake, it is for your name's sake. What you are doing to us is not because of us, it's because of your name. Please, Lord, help us. So unto you I commit these brothers and sisters as they have cried to you tonight, answer their cry. Amen. Give them another chance Amen. to see your move, to see your power, to see your manifestation Amen. and to experience your work again. Amen. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen.